Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Dr. David Welch on the subject of confidence, trust, and empathy in Asia-Pacific security challenges. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. My name is Dr. Andrew Thompson. I'm an adjunct assistant professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and program officer at the Balsi School of International Affairs. Every week on the program, we're joined by an expert in international public policy, global governance, or some other aspect of global affairs here to the studio at the Centre for International Governance Innovation. Joining me today is my co-host on Inside the Issues, Dr. David Welch. Dr. Welch is a senior fellow here at CG and chair in global security at the Balsley School of International Affairs. He's also the lead on a new project that CG has just launched on trust, confidence and empathy in the Asia Pacific region. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Nice to be here. Unusual angle, but it's nice to be here. Tell me a little bit about the project. What does it hope to accomplish? Well, at Asia Pacific security, as you know, is probably the hottest uh, area for traditional security studies right now. Some of the most deadly, uh, potentially deadly conflicts are in play. Uh, the good news is nobody in the Asia Pacific wants war and the economic incentives to avoid war are all uh, very high. But as we know from uh, not least events that happened 100 years ago this year uh, in Europe, high levels of economic interdependence and uh, most people not wanting war doesn't mean you don't get war. So in Asia, we have uh, a number of very well-armed countries, uh, several nuclear-armed countries, uh, with active disputes that are very emotionally charged and in which the danger of accidents and misperceptions and inadvertence are very, very high. So it's a dangerous region. Uh, we're hopeful that we can avoid conflict, uh, but uh, it's always a challenge to figure out how you manage conflicts in a region that's so fraught with uh, historical animosity, um, rampant misunderstanding, sometimes perhaps willful misunderstanding, uh, interplay between domestic politics and international politics, complicating relations between states. The region itself is very institutionalized when it comes to security governance. Uh, so there's the proverbial alphabet soup of security organs that uh, help, are supposed to help keep the lid on uh, challenges of this kind. Uh, but most people would say that they're not particularly effective. There's a lot of institutionalism, but not a lot of high quality conflict management. And so one question is why? If it's not sort of lack of architecture, uh, what's the problem? And, and our view here at CG is that uh, it's not so much the, la the architecture that's wanting, it's what people do with it. And that's what this project is designed to uh, target. So can you say a little bit about these ideas of trust, confidence, and empathy, and uh, how they are, how they could contribute to resolving some of these security challenges. All right. So, if you read anything on Asia Pacific security, you'll find that everyone uses the words confidence and trust a lot. We talk about the importance of building confidence, the importance of building trust. The problem is, no two people use those words in exactly the same way. I think if you look closely, you'll see that. The same person often uses the same word in more than one way, depending on the context. Uh, also, people tend to use those words interchangeably. So you have a, a dialogue about confidence and trust in which not a lot of people are on the same page with respect to what it is they're talking about. And If you don't know what you're talking about, you don't know how to build it. Uh, the most sort of glaring example of this inability to generate useful concepts for conflict management is uh, the recent fairly high level pronouncement by South Korea that uh, trust politic will be the new guiding principle of South Korean uh, foreign policy. Uh, well, it's an interesting idea. It's a great label. What is trust politic? If you look at the speeches and documents that lay it out, you discover pretty quickly that there's no trust in it. Trust politic is all about firmness, consistency, deterring uh, bad behavior by North Korea, punishing it if it occurs, rewarding good behavior if it occurs. Nothing actually about what most people would call trust. So step one is to try to help clarify this confusion and get people on the same song sheet when it comes to these two concepts, conflict and trust. And I, I have a view about how we should understand those, which we'll talk about, I, I guess, uh, shortly. But uh, empathy is a, con a concept that nobody in the Asia Pacific uses in security discourse. And in my view, that's uh, a terrible shame and a missed opportunity uh, because empathy 
is what gets you from confidence to trust. And if you actually have real trust, your security problems more or less go away. So we're, we're trying to clarify and discipline the usage of two key terms and get people thinking about taking empathy seriously and trying to build empathy as a way of actually improving uh, trust. Great. Well, I want to pick up on this uh, in the second portion of the show and look specifically at some of the instances that might be covered in, in the project. We'll be back in a moment with Dr. David Welch. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. Welcome back to the program. David, I wonder if you might expand on these ideas of empathy and trust and explain to our audience how you might, or how the project might go about uh, building these ideas. Sure, so the first task is clearing some of the weeds from the garden. And one of the problems here is that English is the, the dominant language of Asia Pacific security and the English language is a mess. So actually if you look up confidence and trust in the English uh, dictionaries, you'll find that they define confidence as trust and trust as confidence. Uh, but they're not actually exactly the same. They're sort of minor variations and multiple definitions. So as I said, task one is to get everybody on the same song sheet. So how would I like to use these terms? Uh, start with confidence. Now, confidence is a term that became very important in the Cold War and was very useful in helping a soft land the Cold War. And the problem there was this endless fear on both the side of the Americans and NATO and the Soviets and Warsaw Pact uh, that um, there might be some surprise attack, there might be some trickery, uh, there might be cheating when it comes to arms control agreements. And the real pinnacle of the fear there was in 1983 when uh, Ronald Reagan, early in his presidency, uh, was presiding over a, a NATO uh, military exercise called Able Archer, which was practicing the release of tactical nuclear weapons. And it now is clear from the documents that the Soviets honestly thought that might be a cover for a surprise nuclear attack on the Soviet Union. And uh, when Reagan learned that, he was stunned and shocked and actually helped energize uh, him to think about how to manage superpower relations in a less sort of confrontational way. Um, so it was a good shock, but a dangerous one. So a lot of what followed after that were attempts to build confidence. And the heart of that was trying to find ways that each side, even though they were enemies, even though there was lots of hostility, uh, didn't have to worry that they could be attacked by surprise uh, very soon because they could see that nothing was happening that would be any indication of a surprise attack. Um, they would know with quite a long lead time what the schedules were for military exercises. Um, they made arrangements to let the military officers observe each other's military uh, exercises. There were improvements in the channels of communication. All these things that didn't necessarily turn your enemy into your friend, but they let your enemy relax a bit about, uh, you didn't have to fear all the time that they were about to be attacked by a bolt out of the blue. Uh, that's confidence. So I like to think of confidence as a feeling of relative safety that's grounded in situational constraints. Okay. And building confidence is a kind of a mechanical, technical exercise. You just need these agreements on transparency and, and you know, communications and so forth and so on. Trust is different. Trust is uh, also a feeling of safety but it's grounded in the nature of your relationship. So I trust you and you trust me because we know each other and we're friends. Uh, you, I know that you don't mean me harm most of the time. You know that I don't mean you harm right. most of the time. Uh, and so we don't worry about surprise attack because it's not sure. in our character or the nature of our relationship. So uh, how do you get from confidence to trust? Because when you have the trust, we really are friends, different category of relationship. And we don't worry about Canada and the United States going to war because right. they don't have that kind of relationship. So that's the confidence and trust. They're the bookends. It's where you want to start and where you want to get. And empathy, I would argue, is the mechanism to get from one to the other. Okay. And 
In your long experience in Asia, working in Asia, do you think that people will be receptive to this idea of empathy as the link between trust and confidence? Well, not only do I think it, I know they are, because mm -hmm. I've actually sort of piloted this in various places, in Japan and in Seoul and Shanghai, and the receptivity is very high uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, people very quickly realize, oh yes, we've been using confidence and trust interchangeably and we haven't always meant the same thing by it. So they're happy to have a little bit of clarity about how they perhaps ought to discipline their use of those terms. But even more importantly, they don't use the word empathy, and they haven't. So they don't bring to that concept any priors. And so they're willing to begin with a clean slate and start with a shared understanding of what it is. So what is it? What is empathy? Again, if you look in the dictionary, uh, the OED, you'll find several definitions, and they're not all the same thing. And so we have to be a little bit um, specific about how we decide to use the term. Uh, in my view, uh, the best way to think of empathy is uh, very simply as the capacity to understand how another person sees the world. And that's it, full stop. It's just the capacity to understand. It doesn't mean agreement. Uh, it doesn't mean that you share the feeling. There are other definitions of empathy that build these things in. I think we've got perfectly good words to refer to all those other things. Sympathy, that's where you actually share sure. the feeling. Compassion, that's where you have the emotional response that basically reflects somebody else's suffering. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking simply about the capacity to understand. And if you live in a world where people consistently overestimate threat, in other words, they think that the neighbors are really hostile, right. but they're not, then building empathy gives you some room for building some trust. Um, if you live in a world where you're underestimating threat, in other words, your neighbors are actually more hostile than you think, it doesn't have that effect. Sure. If you build empathy, you actually probably increase the likelihood of conflict because you'll know that your adversaries are even more threatening than they are. But my view is that in the Asia Pacific, uh, everyone overestimates threat. No one actually underestimates it. Great. Thank you very much, David. We will be back in a moment with Dr. Welch. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. David, I w wonder if we might focus the discussion of this section on some of the specific hot button issues that are currently um, putting a lot of pressure on security in Asia, in the Asia Pacific region. Right. So there's one big one at the moment which is commanding a lot of attention, and that's the rivalry between Japan and China in the East China Sea. Right. Now, uh, is it a rivalry? If you ask uh, the Chinese, they might say yes, and the Japanese might say it's not a rivalry. But there are conflicts of interest for sure. Uh, a couple of different ones. There's the island dispute over uh, what the Japanese call the Senkaku Islands and what the Chinese call the Diaoyu Islands. And there's uh, maritime disputes, which involve things like resource rights in the, uh, the far eastern part of the continental shelf off China. So the island dispute is the one that is the more uh, dangerous because it's the one that is uh, more politically salient, both among the Chinese and the Japanese right. public. So. The story here, and I'm sure most people are probably familiar with it, is that uh, Japan incorporated the Senkaku Islands uh, into uh, Japanese territory way back at the end of the 19th century. Um, China has a long historical claim to those islands, so does Taiwan. Uh, after World War II, the United States took over uh, the administration of all of the islands between Taiwan and Okinawa, and after a period of time, uh, basically handed them back to Japan um, and treated them as if they were Japanese territory. Right. But uh, two years ago, um, you, can, you can go back a little earlier to start, if you want, telling a story about how the dispute became t serious, but two years ago in particular, uh, the government of Japan uh, bought the islands from their private uh, Japanese owners. And the 
government in Beijing uh, saw that as a deliberate escalation and provocation of the dispute right. because China still claims, had claimed the dispute, the islands, um, certainly since 1978. Now the Japanese government bought the islands uh, to avoid a dispute with China <laughs> because the governor of Tokyo, uh, Shintaro Ishihara, ha had offered to buy them from right. the private owners. And he is a nationalist who was trying to force Japan's hand uh, to take a harder line against what he sees as the Chinese threat, uh, Chinese expansionism. Right. And so Tokyo figured the best way to avoid a diplomatic feud is to make sure Governor Ishihara does not gain possession of the islands, because if he did, within a week, there'd be people there and maybe permanent installations. Right. And they're uninhabited at the moment. Um, so uh, when I go to China, all I hear is Chinese complaints about Japan deliberately provoking China right. by nationalizing the islands. Japanese don't see it that way. They see it as they tried to avoid an escalation in the conflict. And they see the China's reaction as an opportunistic attempt to establish um, Chinese sovereignty. And then recently we had China announce an air defense identification zone, which again, everyone in Japan, United States, Korea interpreted it as um, part of the salami strategy of bit by bit extending Chinese right. claims and authority. And, and the fear in some quarters in Japan is at the end of the day, ultimately China will find itself in possession of the entire Ryukyu Island chain, including Okinawa, and exercise hegemony over the Pacific Ocean west of Midway Island. Now, there are a small number of people in China who talk about this as something that China would like. Right. These are basically almost entirely lone voices. They don't speak for anybody really but themselves. But it's easy to listen to these and to think that they reflect real, deep, mainstream Chinese aspirations about China's rise, China's regional hegemony 30, 40, 50 years down the road. And it's scary in Japan. So that's, that's a lack of empathy on both sides right. here. Um, and it's dangerous in part because the islands are so infused with symbolism over unresolved historical animosities and grievances that it's easy for the emotions to take over if something unforeseen happens, like you know, a balloonist actually does manage to land on the islands and plant a Chinese flag, or some Japanese nationalists manage to do the same thing. Um, and at that point, you find yourself in a crisis and uh, emotional charge decision-making contexts are ones in which people make bad decisions. So right. that's why it's dangerous. Right. How do you build empathy, though? How do you get people to understand that you know, Japan actually is not a threat right. to remilitarize and reassert its hegemony over Asia? And China's not actually trying to control Okinawa. This is hard because you have to persuade um, not, not only leaders now, but also publics, that fairly firmly held beliefs are wrong. So it's a, there's a supply side and a demand side problem to building empathy. And the demand side is uh, the people who need it have to realize that they lack it. Right. And leaders of countries, people who sort of just read the newspaper for 10 minutes a day, generally aren't very self-critical tend to think that what they believe is right. There also has to be a supply side. You have to be able to show uh, convincingly that people's understandings are, are wrong. Um, now, we've done that uh, in the context of historical projects many times in the past. Right. Uh, my colleagues Jim Blight and Janet Lang and I have, uh, since the 1980s, been involved in a series of very ambitious projects, uh, critical oral history projects, um, that are designed to give former adversaries opportunities to revisit historical conflicts with the, uh, with the benefit of new documentation, newly right. declassified documents, and with the benefit of scholars and other experts, and have a conversation about things like what they were really thinking, what they really believed, what they really wanted, needed, feared, what their interests were. And these have always been fascinating because uh, every time we had one of these projects on the Cuban Missile Crisis, on the Vietnam War, 
on detente during the carter Brezhnev years. People come to the table nervous and defensive and convinced they're right. But after not that much interaction, the barriers begin to break down and you begin to see real conversations and the sharing of real insights and information. And by the end of these processes, you know, Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense, you know, giving Fidel Castro a hug and telling him, if I were you, I think I also would have believed that the United <laughs> States was about to invade right. Cuba in 1962 or, right. or something like that. You see these remarkable transformations. This is harder to do in contemporary Asia-Pacific security uh, right. because issues like the senkaku Diaoyu dispute, they're live. History is live. Right. You can't take a historical event and treat it as a laboratory mm -hmm. for building empathy because that is not a historical event. That's a current event. Great. Thank you so much, Dave. We will be back in a moment. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. David, for the last segment of the show, I'd like to talk about the project specifically and what it hopes to accomplish and how you might go about doing that. Right, so we have a three-year project and we're just at the beginning and the, the concept papers, so to speak, are more or less in place. And we know that there's interest and receptivity in the region to having conversations about this. Uh, but your question is what, sort of mechanically, operationally, do we do to try to improve this right. situation? So. To some extent, phase one is actually trying to answer that question. We don't really have the opportunity here to do critical oral history, right. um, as for reasons I just explained. So we have to do it in real time. What can you do in real time that's actually going to work, and why do you think it might work? Uh, so to some extent, we're, the first step is to try to design a process that can open up space for a real conversation, not posturing. Uh, not you know defensive positionalism, not shouting, right. uh, where people can actually begin to have the discussion that will let them question their own preconceptions about other countries' interests and needs and wants and fears. Uh, now you can imagine having that kind of discussion at one of several levels, and in the security jargon, we've got track one discussions, right. track two discussions, track 1.5. So um, for those who don't pay attention to the jargon. Track one means leaders. Leaders talking to leaders, right. more or less in an official way. Track two is scholars and other unofficial people talking to each other in a very unofficial way. And track 1.5 is, in my view, sort of that sweet spot between the first two where you've got the, the scholars and the experts who aren't speaking officially, but you have officials in the room and they're participating in a non-official capacity. So they're not um, they're not beholden to the official line in these conversations. They can say what they think, but everybody understands that they're speaking on their own behalf and not on right. behalf of their governments. So right. at the track one level, that's where this you know, the demand problem that I spoke about is biggest. You know, leaders are not very self-critical. And it's sure. almost impossible just to put leaders in the room and say, start talking and build empathy. I say impossible, but almost impossible, but not fully impossible because we have had cases where that worked and where it worked pretty well. Right. And the classic case is Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev. And it worked in part because there was this traumatic shock in the early 1980s, the exercise Abel Archer thing, which right. made Ronald Reagan turn white, um, as also did you know, the film The Day After, which showed almost immediately before that, and the shooting down of Korean Airlines Flight 007 on right. September 1st, 1983. Like bang, 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 Ronald Reagan was, was shown convincing proof that uh, the high level of tension he had created through his policy of, of in-your-face uh, deterrence and confrontation and arms racing, driving the Soviets into the ground, was actually backfiring and making right. the situation worse. So he needed to find some other way to reduce nuclear danger. And Gorbachev came into office not having had a background in international affairs 
And he could see that the level of danger was extraordinarily high. And he began casting about very consciously for ideas about you know, how to approach the Cold War in a different way. And fortunately, the two of them more or less came at the same time to the conclusion that they had to improve mutual understanding before anything else could happen. So that's, uh, that was a case where you had two leaders actually motivated through a recognition that they lacked empathy to build it. And they didn't convert each other, right? Ronald Reagan didn't turn Mikhail Gorbachev right. into a Republican right-wing capitalist, and Gorbachev didn't turn Reagan into a, a communist. But they did manage to have, uh, to reach a high degree of empathy, and a lot followed from that. It was much easier to actually build the trust right. and help soft land the Cold War. As I say, that's very rare. I don't see that happening right now right. between Shinzo Abe <laughs> and Park Geun-hee and Xi Jinping. Um, just getting them in the same room is proving to be hard enough. Right. So that's not on the agenda. Track two is pretty easy because scholars uh, like this stuff. Scholars are in the business of questioning their assumptions and their understandings. Um, a good scholar will change their mind and be open to evidence and information that challenges what they believe. So the demand side for empathy when it, talks, when it comes to scholars talking to each other is is not such a problem, and the supply side is not bad either. But the problem is that scholars all by themselves <laughs> don't have a lot of impact. Fair enough. So it's not very often that you get leaders inviting scholars in and saying, tell me why I'm wrong about this part of the world and how I can fix it. We would have lots to say, right. but we don't get that opportunity. It's in the track 1.5 where you actually have the opportunity for at least some officials uh, to observe the conversation and absorb or the new information. And uh, the fact that they're there at all usually means they're at least halfway curious about whether sure. their own understandings uh, are right. And then they can go bo back inside the system and you know, report up the chain. And with luck down the road, you actually do get some kind of meaningful change. Perhaps even they can persuade their leaders to have a serious conversation for a change about, about something. Right. So uh, the CG project will uh, certainly start with uh, track two. That's already happened. We're going to move as quickly as we can into track 1.5 uh, discussions. Uh, the real trick is figuring out the vehicle, you know, what's sort of the crucible that you use for the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think the current plan is to actually just focus very directly on this question of national interests. Everybody talks about national interests and assumes that they're either kind of immutable, they're fixed, they're given by the structure of the international system. They're not. National interests are something that people construct and they come from their cultural backgrounds, their historical experiences, their understandings of their role vis-a-vis -vis their societies. Uh, there's no way the Chinese should fear the Japanese. Uh, Japan has done militarism. They've been there and done that. It didn't work out well. They reacted badly to it. Right. Um, they actually managed to put it behind them in their constitution. And uh, they are very happy about the fact that they're a post-imperial country and there's nobody in Japan except a very small number of crazies who are probably adolescents who are underemployed <laughs> who really want to Sort of resurrect the old Japanese empire. Right. Uh, so Japan has no taste or stomach for resurgent militarist nationalism, but they have a lot of taste and stomach for getting their economy back on track, facing their looming demographic challenge, facing their energy challenges, and so on and so forth. So those are what the real Japanese national interests are, right. not picking a fight with China. Now, we only have a, a couple minutes left, but um, what is the what is the benefit of an empathetic Asia? What does this mean for for security, for not only for the region but but for the world as a whole? If uh, if if this understanding that is lacking right now uh, starts to starts to form. Right. So if I'm right that everyone overestimates threat, then everyone can relax. And uh, you can begin to start looking at these disputes, like these territorial disputes, maritime disputes, not as sort of existential challenges, 
uh, or as, as things in which you know, fundamental self-respect is at stake, but as sort of technical problems in need of technical solutions. So you take the heat off them, you take them right. off the burner, and then you can deal with them. Um, so, you know, the fairly high level empathy between Canadians and Americans. We have a territorial dispute too. Uh, most people don't know it, but there's an mm -hmm. island in the Gulf of Maine that was claimed by Canada and the United States, occupied by Canada, right. called Machia Seal Island. Almost nobody knows about it. Those who know about it tend to giggle about it because of the high level of trust. Right. And you only have the high level of trust because of the high level of empathy. So if Japan understood that you know, China doesn't want to conquer Japan and recreate the Middle Kingdom, um, Japan, China, frankly, is mostly concerned with solving its internal sure. challenges, which are quite frankly, much more severe than Japan's internal challenges, including the aging challenge. Right. Uh, Ch China has its plate full at home. It doesn't have the need or the appetite to sort of become a regional hegemon. Um, the few people who talk in China in that way make my life more difficult because the Japanese tend to listen to them and believe them. Right. But it's a very small number of people. Right. So with luck, you can turn these potentially explosive flashpoints into management problems. Right. That's terrific. This has been wonderful, David. Uh, it sounds like a great project, and I wish you all the best of luck. Thanks. And thank you to our audience for joining us. Please join us again for uh, next week for another episode of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter.